The Gypsy Prophecy by Bram Stoker. Really think, said the doctor, that at any rate one of us should try to go and try whether or not the thing is in a posture. Good, said Costadine. Of dinner, we will take our cigars and stroll over to the camp. Accordingly, when dinner was over, the tour finished. Joseph R. Christine, Christine, his friend, Dr. Burley, went over to the east side of the moor where Gypsy encampment lay. As they were leaving, Mary Constantine, who had walked so far as the end of the garden where it opened in the lane way, called after her husband, Mind, Joshua, you are to give them a fair chance and don't give them any clue of a fortune. Don't you get, don't you get flirting with any of the Gypsy Maidens, take care and keep Gerald out of harm. Answer Costadine held up his hand. As if taking a stage oath, whistled in the air of the old song, the gypsy countess. Gerald joined in the strain, then breaking into merry laughter, two men passed along the lane way, to come and turning now, then to wave their hands to Mary, who leaned over the gate in the twilight, looking after them. It was a lovely evening with the summer. The very air was full of rest and quite happiness. As though an outward type of peacefulness, a joy made a heaven, the home of the young married folk. Cousin life had not been an eventful one, and his semi renament been ever known was in the wooing of Mary Wilson, a young, long, continued objection, ambitious parents who had expected a brilliant match for their daughter, only daughter, Mrs. And Mrs. Wilson. They discovered the attachment of the young barrister, they tried to keep the young people apart sending it all away for a long round of visits. Having made a promise not to correspond with her lover during an absence, love, however, had stood the test, neither absence nor neglect, seeing the cooler passion of the young man. Jealousy seemed a thing unknown, it sounded a cruel nature, so after a long period of waiting, the parents had given in, the young folk were married. They were living, had been living in the cottage a few months, were just beginning to feel at home. Gerald Burley Joshua's old college chum, himself a some time victim of Mary's beauty, had arrived a week before to stay with him for a long time as he could tear himself away from his work in London. When her husband had quite disappeared, Mary went into the house, sitting down at the piano, gave an hour of Mendelssohn. It was but a short walk across the common before the cigars required renewing the two men reached the big camp. The place was pitch wrecks of just big camps, when the villages and business, business is good. Usually are very few persons around the fire, investigating their money in prophecy, and large number of the others poorer, other morris, who stayed just outside the bounds, just near enough to see all that went on. As the two gentlemen approached the villagers who knew Joshua, made way a little, and a pretty keen-eyed gypsy girl tipped up, and asked to tell their fortunes. Joshua held his hand, but the girl, without seeing, seeming to see it, and stared at its face in a very odd manner. Gerald nudged him. You must cross her hand with Sylvia, he said. One of the most important parts of the mystery, Joshua took it. He parked it, a half-crown, had it out for her, without looking at it. She answered, you have to cross the gypsy's, gold, uh, gypsy's hand with gold. Joe laughed, you are premium as a subject, said Joshua. Was the kind of man, the usual, universal kind, could tolerate being stared at by his pretty girl. So, with some little deliberation, he answered, All right, here you are, my pretty girl. Let's give me a real good fortune for it. He handed her half a sovereign, which he took, saying, It's not for me to give good fortune or bad. But only read what the stars have said. She looked at his right hand and turned his palm upward. When his eyes met, she dropped as though she'd been, it'd been red hot. With a startled look, guided swiftly away, Lived in the curtain of the ground tent, which could not be the central camp. She was busy in. Sold again, said the cynical Gerald. Joshua stood in a little maze, not a river satisfied. They both watched the large tent. A few moments they emerged from the opening. Not the young girl, but a stately looking woman, middle aged and commanding presence. Then she appeared, the whole camp seemed to stand still. There were tongues and laughter and noise at work there. For a second or two, rested. Every man and woman who sat or crouched, who lay, stood up and faced the imperial looking gypsy. The Queen, of course, murmured Gerald. We're luck tonight, the gypsy queen threw a glancing 
searching glance around the camp, and then, without hesitation, an instant, he straight over and stood before Joshua. Hold your hand, she said in a commanding voice. Again, Gerald spoke, sort of voice. As I've been not spoken in that way since I was at school. Your hand must be crossed with gold. A hundred percent at this game. With a jewel, Gerald. Joshua laid another half covering on his unturned arm. Jesse looked to the hand and nutted brows. The same looking up his face said, Have you a strong will? Have you a true heart? Could pray for one you love? Hope so, but I'm afraid. I'm not vanity enough to say yes. Then I would answer for you. But I read resolution in your face. Resolution desperate de- determined it may be. For you have a wife you love. Yes, exactly. Then leave her at once. Never see her face again. Go from her now. Will love is fresh. Your heart is free from wicked tent. Go quick. Go far. Never see her face again. Joshua drew away. His hand quickly said, Thank you, stiffly but sarcastically, began to move away. I say, said Gerald, I'm not doing going like that, old man. No use in being indignant with the stars or the prophet. Moreover, your sovereign, what of it? At least hear the matter out. Science, Roland, Roland bowed, concluded the queen. You know not what you do. Let him go, and go, ignorant, if he will not be warned. Joshua immediately turned back. At all events, we have seen this thing out, he said. Now, madam, you have given me advice, but I paid you for fortune. Be warned, said Gypsy. The stars have been silent for long. Let a mystery still wrap them around. My dear madam, I do not get within touch of the mystery every day. I prefer my money knowledge rather than ignorance. I get the later commodity for nothing when I want any, any of it. <coughs> Gerald echoed the sentiment. As for me, I have a large and stable stock in my hand. She's a queen eyed the two men sternly, then said, as you wish, you are chosen for yourself, and have met warning with scorn, and peel with levity. On your own head be the doom. Amen, said Gerald. In a perilous gesture, the queen took Jeffrey's hand again, again to tell his fortune. I see here the flowing of blood, your flow before long, is running in my sight, it flows in a broken circle of seven rings. Go on, said Joshua. Martin Gerald was silent. May I say I speak plainer? Certainly. The commonplace mortals want something defiant. defiant. Stars a long way off. They have message words get somewhat dulled in the message. Did she shudder and spoke impressively? This is the hand of murderer, the murderer of his wife. She dropped the hand and turned away. Joshua laughed, do you know? Did I? I think if I were you, I should prophesy some jurist presence in my, in my system. For instance, you may say his hand is the hand of murderer. Well, whatever it may be in the future, potentially, is the present not one. You ought to give your prophecy in such terms a hand which will be a murderer, or rather, hand of one who will be a murderer of his wife. Dars are not good and technical questions. Jesse made no ply at any kind, but drooping head, a resplendent mane, walked slowly to a tent, lifted the curtains, and disappeared. As speaking, two men turned in the woods and walked across the moor. Presently, some little dissertation, Gerald spoke. Of course, old oh man, this is only a joke, a ghastly one, but still a joke. But what would it, would it not be well to keep it to ourselves? How do you mean, well, not tell your wife? You might alarm her. Alarm her? My dear Gerald, you are thinking of it. Why would she be alarmed for afraid? Or be afraid of me if all the gypsies ever didn't come from Bohemia agreed I to murder her, or even to have a hard thought of her, while well, so long as she was saying John Robinson. Gerald remonstrated, Oh, mere fellow, women, superstitious, for our man and we men are. Also, are they blessed or cursed with nervous system, of which we are strangers? I see too much in, it, in my work, not to realize it. Take my advice and do not let her know, or you will, not, will frighten her. Does her lips unconsciously harden? He answered, my dear fellow, I would not have a worse secret for my wife. Why, it would be the beginning of a new order of things between us. We have no secrets from each other. If you ever have, you might begin to look out to have something odd between us. Still, said Gerald, at risk of unwelcome interference, I say again, be warned in time. Gypsy's very word, said Joshua. You and she seem quite of one accord. Tell me, old man, is this a put-up thing? You told me in gypsy camp. She ranged on all, in all of, of her majesty. This was said with air bantering earnestness. 
Joseph assured him, he only heard the camp that morning, but he made fun of every answer of his friend, and the process of his rally. The time passed, and they entered the cottage. Mary said in pen, but not playing, dim twilight was walked, walked. Wait, some very tender feelings at her breast, and her eyes were full of t- gentle tears. When the man came to her, she stole over, husband sighed and kissed him, dressed his track of tra- tragic attitude. Mary said in a deep voice, before you approach me, listen to the words of fate. Tars are broken and doom is sealed. What is it, my dear? dear? Tell me the fortune, but not to frighten me. Not all, my dear. A tooth which is very well, you should know. Nay, it is necessary to, to let your arrangements can be made beforehand. Everything be decently done in order. Go on, dear, and listen. Mary Considine, your effigy may yet be seen, and married to her souls. Judas impertinent stars renounce they have tile tidings. And his hand is red with blood, your blood, Mary. Mary, my God, she sprang forward, but in too late to catch her, she fell fainting on the floor. Told you, said George, Gerald, you don't know them as well as I do. Of the little while Mary covered from her swoon, only full in strong hysterics, in which she laughed and wept and raved and cried, Keep him away from me, Moshua, my husband, and many other words of entreaty and fear. Joshua Constantine was in a state of mind of bordering agony, and then at last Mary became calm. He knelt by her and kissed her feet and hands and hair, called all the sweet names and said all the tender things his lips could frame. All that night he sat by his side her and held her hand. For all through the night and up to the early morning, she kept waking for the sleep, crying out as if in fear, while she st- till she was comforted by the consciousness her husband was watching beside her. Breakfast was late the next morning, but doing it, Joshua received a telegram which would have required him to drive to Wivering, nearly twenty miles, he was loath to go, but he would not hear his road raining. And so before noon, he drove off his dog cart alone. When he was gone, Mary tied to a room. She did not appear at lunch. But when the afternoon tea was served on lawn, under the great willowing willow, she came to join her guests. She quite recovered from her illness of the evening before. After some casual remarks, he said to Gerald, of course, it's very silly about last night, but could not help feeling frightened. Indeed, I would feel so if I let myself think of it. But after all these people... Can may imagine things. I have to go to test and then follow Holly failed to show prediction is false. Indeed it be false, he said sadly. What is your plan? said Gerald. I shall go myself to Creature Cats. My fortune told me the Queen. Capital, may I go with you? Oh no, what would that would spoil it. Do you know you and guess at me and suit her utterance accordingly? I shall go alone this afternoon. The afternoon was gone, Mary Constantine was uh, took her way to the gypsy encampment. Gerald went with her as far as the near edge, come and returned alone. Half an hour and hardly used lapped, and Mary into the drawing room, where he lay in a surf through a reading. Gertie pale and was a state of extreme excitement. Hardly as she passed through the threshold, she clapped and sank moaning on the carpet. Gerald rushed to her aid, but by a great effort she controlled herself, motioned him to be silent. He waited his ready question, attention to her wish had seemed to be the best help, for in a few minutes she was somewhat recovered was able to tell him what had passed. When I got to the camp, she said that he did not seem to be a soul about. Went into the centre and so stood there. So a little woman stood beside me. So he told me I was wanted. She said, I held out of my hand, laid a piece of silver in it. He took from her neck a small golden trinket, laid it there also. Then seizing over two, threw her them into the steam. They lay and by. Then she took my hand in hers and spoke. Now by blood is in this guilty place, she turned away. I caught hold of her hand, and I said, tell me more. But for some hesitation, she said, Alas, I see you lying in the husband's feet. His hands are red and with blood. Joe did not feel at all at ease and tried to laugh it off. Suddenly, he said, this world woman has a craze about murder. Do not laugh, said Mary, I cannot bear it. And then, as if they sudden impulse, she left the room. Not long after Josh returned, bright and cheery, as angry as Fanta, after his long drive, his presence cheered his wife. The scene much brighter than she did not mention the episode of the gypsy camp, so Gerald did not mention it either. By tactic consent, that tasted content, so it was not alluded to for doing the night evening. 
There was a strange settled look on Mary's face, which Gerald could not but observe. Morning Joshua came back, came down to the breakfast later than usual. Mary had been up about the house for a mark, for an hour, early hour. By the time Drew, she seemed to get a little nervous, now and again threw around an anxious look. Gerald could not help noticing none of them those at breakfast could get her set on satisfactorily with their food. Not altogether that the chops were tough, but the knives were all so blunt. Being guests, he of course made no sign. Presently he saw Joshua draw his thumb across the side of the edge of the knife, a conscious sort of way, and at action Mary turned pale and almost fainted. After breakfast he went about out to the lawn. Mary's making up a bouquet and said to her husband, Get me a few of the tea roses, dear. Joshua pulled down a crust from the front of the house. Sam Bent was not tougher, too tough to break. Put his hand in his pocket to get his pipe. But in vain, lend me your knife, Gerald, he said. Gerald was not one, not got, not got one, so he went to the breakfast room and took one from the table. Came out filling its edge and frambling. Well, I don't know if this happened at all. The knife, the edges seem all ground off. Mary turned away hurriedly, entered the house. Joshua tried to sever the stalk with a blunt knife. As country cooks severed the knives of crow, schoolboys cut twine. Little if he finished the class. Cluster of roses grew thick, determined to gather a great brunch. He could find not a single sharp knife in the sideboard. The cut roses kept. So he called Mary when he came, told her the state of things. He looked so agitated, so miserable, that he could not help knowing the truth. As if it standing the heart and hurt. Pastor, do you mean to say you've done it? To be broken, oh Joshua, I was so afraid. He paused and set. Right, look what came across his face, Mary, said he. It is not all the tr- is that all the trust you have in me? I would have not believed have not believed it. Oh Joshua, Joshua, she said, cried intuitively, forgive me, and he wept bitterly. Joshua went for a moment and said, I see how it is. We shall end better in this, or we shall all go mad. He ran into the drawing room. What are you doing? Where are you going? almost screamed Mary. Gerald knew what he meant, what he meant. He would not be tied to blunt instruments by the force of superstition. Yet surprised he saw him come through the French window, bearing in his hand a large goroa knife, which he usually lay on the centre table, which had his brother sent him from northern India. One of those great hunting knives, which worked such havoc at close quarters, enemies of loyal cookers. During a mountain, a great weight was so heavily balanced in the hand as so to seem light, the edge like a razor, with one of those knives as Gurkha could cut the sheep in two. And Mary saw him come out of the room with a weapon in his hand, screaming in agony of fright. Her hysterics of last night were promptly renewed. Joshua went towards her, seeing her falling down, falling. She threw down the knife and tried to catch her. However, it was just a second too late. Two men cried out in horror, simultaneously. They saw her fall upon the naked blade. When Gerald rushed over, he found in the building a left hand which struck the blade, which lay partially towards the gro- upwards of grass. Some of the small vents were cut through, and the blood gushed freely from the wound. Drawing it up, up he pointed it out to Joshua. The wedding ring was severed by the steel. They carried her fate into the house. When after a while she came out, her arm in a sling, she's peaceful. Husband and among it and happy, she said to her husband, The gypsy is wonderful near the wonderful near truth, too near to the real thing. Ever occur now, dear. Joffa bent over and kissed the wounded hand.